It was decided that, you know, that was the target, was to get 200 out at one go. And the hut couldn't accommodate more than 200 people. So that, that was the, why it was limited to, to that number. Uh, so it was decided the first 50 were the people who um, was considered to have the best chance of making the home run. Then the other 150, you know, everyone who'd been involved were asked if they wanted their names to go into the hat. Not everybody wanted to. Uh, I don't know what the total number was who actually decided, but then their names were then put in the hat and they were drawn out. Uh, and they went up to 230, actually, in case of people, you know, for any dropouts and things like that. Uh, my pal Finney was 214, I was 215. <laughs> so on, that, on, the, on the day, 24th of March, all those who were going, who'd drawn the numbers for going out had to be moved into hut 104. And we who were residents of 104 had to move out and take their place. This had to be done on a very disciplined, um, sort of regular basis so that the Germans wouldn't think, what the hell's all these people shifting back and, and forwards. Decided that 9, 9 p.m. which should be the start of the breakout. He got to the top of the ladder and he found that the boards had all walked. They'd been there for 10 days and they had to be moved, but he couldn't not bash them or anything because they were in hearing distance of this goon box and the foot patrols either side. So all he could do was try and wriggle it away. After half an hour, he was completely exhausted and his place was taken by a chap called Marshall. He eventually got some movement out and the actual breakout was on 10.15. We have a photograph of the breakout found afterwards. So that's, that's the ladder. This is Rubberneck, one of the, the chief, uh, one of the set things. But that is the size of the tunnel exit. Break out at 10.15, but then calamity. Found we were 10 foot short of the trees. We hadn't miscalculated, although some people said we had. What had happened was that this row of trees, there was a bay in it which we hadn't noticed, and we just happened to hit the centre of that bay, so we were 10 feet short. There was a hurried discussion at the base of the tunnel with um, Schwarzenegger Bushel, who was down there, what should they do? Should they board it up again and go on, on another day and, and extend the tunnel a bit further? But then he brought the, the clincher. He said, but all the passes and the forging, all the letters and everything had been dated for that day. So it had to be on the 24th of March. Harry Ball was sent out into the wood with a rope and by a system of signals was able to tell them when it was safe, because these men in the goon boxes, their attention was with the searchlights into the centre of the compound. It was the foot patrol men who were the danger. Fortunately, they met in the middle and marched either side. So as they marched away, then we could emerge. But as soon as he reached the end and turned round, then it had to stop. But obviously this made progress very slow. We were soon behind programme. Then one o'clock in the morning, an air raid sign. All the lights went out. Ideal. The only snag was that all the lights in Harry went out as well. So someone had to nip along and light all the little oil lamps, which took some time. But once that was done, then progress was much, much better and we caught up a little. Then the all clear came and lights were resumed and back to the rope signalling again. By five o'clock in the morning, it was decided that this was nearly at the time that it would begin, soon be daylight and that number 90 would be the last man to go. And he was 
sort of perched on the trapdoor of Hut 104. But for some reason or other, this foot guard decided to cross the road and march back up this side. He probably wanted to relieve himself. Anyway, he kept steadily marching up until he was virtually standing right on, his next foot would have been on, virtually on top of the chap who was waiting to emerge, squad leader Trent. He must have detected some movement, the goon, because he started to whip his rifle off his shoulder. Rebel Carter, who was on the end of the rope, jumped out, don't shoot, don't shoot, Nick Sheezen. Of course he did shoot, he pulled the trigger. Fortunately, the, the bullet went up straight up in the air. But that meant that Harry was discovered and it was all over. 80 men had actually got out. Four were captured on the exit. Uh, before they could get away. So 76 actually got away. Of that 76, only three made the home run. Not a bad proportion, actually. It, does, it sounds minuscule, but it's not bad. But there were two Norwegians and a Dutchman. All the rest were captured within two weeks. 15 returned to the camp. Three went, finished up at uh, Steigloff 1, which they'd rebuilt up in the Baltic. Five of them finished up in uh, Sachsenhausen concentration camp, in which they commenced to dig a tunnel and escape from there. Unfortunately, they were captured in within a month. But that meant 50, and those 50 were handed over to the Gestapo and murdered in cold blood. That was on the direct orders of Adolf Hitler, who, as you know, was Chancellor of Germany. My number drawn out of the hat was 215. At the time, obviously, I regretted it. I was very sorry because everyone... I mean, well, it's not everybody wants to go in. I, I, I was one of the ones who did want to go. <laughs> uh, I'd been in there long enough by that time. Uh, but... When the, obviously the news came through of the 50 being shot, uh, it was with a feeling of some relief. In fact, everyone had this relief um, that they had not been involved. And because uh, my pilot, um, Ian Muir, he was one of the diggers. He he was no, actually number 90, and he was sitting on the edge of the trapdoor, ready to go down. Uh, he because that he was the la to be the last one allowed out that night because we were, you know, we were so far behind uh, the timetable. And afterwards, he said, "Thank God I didn't get down that trapdoor." And, you know, this was the relief. It was, it was a, a terrible atmosphere when we heard of uh, our colleagues being murdered. And, I mean, the Jerrys, the, the Luftwaffe people, they, they, were, they were ashamed about it. And they, I mean... Did we achieve our objective? Well, records show that a nationwide hue and cry, Gross Fahndung, was raised. Over five million, it was the highest search order capable. There were certainly two divisions of the army who were located with us searching out. And as I say, there were over five million. There were 4,000 arrests, mainly deserters from their own forces. So we certainly made the use, major use of the army's forces and resources. But what a terrible uh, price we paid. Again, futility of war. It's never left me, the experience. And I, um, people said, oh, you were unlucky to be shot down so early. 
Okay, I say to him, I couldn't care less, I'm alive today uh, to tell the tale, but I'm pr really proud that I was ex I had the opportunity to experience it and the people I met and if you like I think it made me a better person than I was because of those a lot of people I, I met out there <laughs> um, I don't think there's many days when I haven't you don't think something you, you think about it um, and um, but I don't regret it, you know. Well, in fact, I say I'm, I'm proud that I was associated with it. And uh, but I can't understand why people are so interested <laughs> in uh, well, which to me is sort of almost commonplace sort of experience, you know.